Shoop 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 bidu bidu shoop 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 bidu bidu. What a good fun ride or shine. Today's the day I make you mine. Shoop shoop bidu bidu. The sun is rising over the hay. I know it's gonna be a wonderful day. So what a good fun ride or shine. Hello and welcome back. And welcome to the final episode in our first series on inspiring leadership. And thank you for the terrific feedback that you've sent in. It's very much appreciated and very welcome. The purpose of these podcasts, as you will know by now, is quite simply to learn from the best. We want to understand what makes a great business leader. How do they focus? How do they get people to follow their vision? How do they motivate? How do they deal with failure? And how can they use their influence for the good of all of us. Albert Schweitzer said example is not the main thing in influencing others. It is the only thing. We will learn from experiences, good and bad, and that will always be our best teacher. There is always something to learn. Why invent pastry when we can use our grandmother's recipes? I'm Daryl Cook, the co-founder of law and professional services firm Gunnar Cook and the author of To Innovate or Not to Innovate. And today I'm joined by Sir Peter Fahey. Peter is the former Chief Constable of Greater Manchester Police, the second largest police force in the UK, and where he led some 13,000 police officers and staff. He then spent two years as Chief Executive of the Street Children Charity Retrack and is now Chair of Plus Dane Housing Association, the trustee of a large number of other charities. He was knighted for his services to policing in 2012. Today's podcast is slightly different in that we are going to discuss the things that we have learned from the first series and our august guests under, if I may say, the tutelage of one of the UK's best leaders. Should be fun, so stay tuned. We began the series with a fascinating discussion with psychology expert Professor Damien Hughes. Damien has worked with businessmen and women as well as with many successful sports stars. We asked him, what is an inspiring leader? And this is what he said. There's a really nice model that I sometimes talk about with leaders that comes from uh, the work of Warren Buffett when he was speaking um, particularly about the Berkshire Hathaway group that has led to such success over so long. And he says a leader should be viewed through three particular lenses. Uh, and I think these three lenses contain the keys for what you describe as an inspirational leader. I think the first lens is energy. So a leader has to bring a positive energy to a room, to a group, to anybody that he interacts with. The second lens is they've got to bring an intelligence and so they can speak with credibility about the topic that, um, that they're presenting on or that they're renowned for. But the third criteria that Buffett demands is integrity. You've got to be transparent about what you stand for and then you've got to role model those behaviours in pretty much every situation. Now, Buffett's advice is if you're a leader that's got high energy and high intelligence, but you don't have much in the way of integrity, you should have no part to play in any high-performing team or business. Because the essence is people don't follow a hypocrite. We're, we're wired to follow people that role model what they're asking everybody else to do. So there's a very powerful primitive instinct in us that we follow people that demonstrate very clearly and demonstrably integrity. I love that, Peter. I think that's, uh, that's a great start. And to use Warren Buffett, um, uh, uh, I think, is, uh, is a great start to the podcast. So to talk about energy, you know, the energy and enthusiasm that leaders bring, the intelligence, the incredibility, and that integrity aspect, which I think is mis misunderstood by a lot of people. What do you understand that, by that, Peter? Well, I think at first it comes from a personal level. It comes between the gap between what you say and what you do. Um, and I always said to my officers, you can't have a little bit of integrity. You have to have in complete integrity. So I think a lot of it is about, you know, your own values um, and how they translate into behaviour. But then I think an organisation has to have integrity. Uh, and that's, again, about that gap between what are the, the values, the words on the wall, on the posters, whatever, and actually what the staff experience in practice so you can't really say that, you know, you want your staff to be professional 
um, and have high, high integrity um, and do the best they can if what the experience of the organisation is, for instance, the computers don't work, there's not enough printers, you know, the police cars in the back of the yard don't work. You know, and for me, an, another word which is often a mi- uh, missing is, is alignment. If you want that integrity, you've got to have alignment that everything in your organisation adds up. Whatever you say are those values, the way you want to work. Staff will judge that on the basis of, well, that's fine, but what is my day-to-day experience about how this organisation operates, how I'm treated myself, you know, how the HR department treats me? So I think alignment, congruence, coherence, all these are important words, but essentially, absolutely, it comes down to integrity. Um, At a personal level, as I say, that gap between what you say and what you do, and an organisational level, that gap between the words on the wall, the vision statements, um, all these fine fine things you produce, but actually what staff experience day to day about how this organisation operates and how I'm treated myself. And it does lead into as well what he was referring to as well. It leads to that authenticity, doesn't it? And that transparency. And that's what people are looking for from their leaders. People who are very authentic who live the values. And that's what integrity comes into that uh, uh, absolutely I think it's about authenticity and I, and I think again it's about honesty it's about being honest with your own staff um, and if necessary the public about when things go wrong um, or where there are failings um, and part of that as well is constantly going out and testing that you know for me it was really important you know some people have called it walking by you know, managing by walking about but it was actually going out on the front line speaking to staff um, understanding what was going on Um, and being willing to confront that reality uh, and to sometimes take that back to the people that were possibly supposed to be providing those services, whether it was IT, HR, um, finance or or whatever. Uh, And another element, I think, is is charisma. I think you, you have to be a bit of an actor. You know, when I was speaking to my staff, particularly at the sort of events you run, you know, where you are explaining the vision, where it's a consultation event, whatever, I always felt I had to take a deep breath before going onto the stage and act my part. And and Damien also spoke about the issue about positivity, about the fact that you can go around blaming everybody else. And, and particularly, you know, in, in the danger in some like policing is you blame everything on the home office or the media or the public. Uh, but a, a key part as well um, it is about having, you know, that positive, as he talked about it, that ability to lift the room. And I think that does come from your own charisma and, and it is your, your, the quality of your communication. And as I say, it is almost like being an actor on that stage. I think that's so important, isn't it? I often think that kind of that optimism is a force multiplier. And as a leader, you've got to lead from the front by showing that uh, mm. that optimism. But but you're right. And what Damien goes on to talk about in in, in that earlier um, podcast was about that personal responsibility mm-hmm. as well um, uh, and I think we do do you not feel that sometimes we live in a bit of a society where we're quite happy to delegate blame and to look to others and to um, there's a lot of judgment goes around and we're very we find it very easy to step back and say oh that, that's not my responsibility um, but to take the level of responsibility he talks about with with particular sports people, et cetera, things like that, who really have to take it on because they're being judged to be number one, is probably a different level than the rest of us uh, exist at. No, I think, again, that, you know, it's a very important lesson because I think it's also what some people have called in organisations a blame culture. You know, that when something goes wrong, it's the people that are blamed. Um, and we can't. We are very judgmental, and I think increasingly judgmental in a in a short term political media world. Uh, and you, as a leader, again, have to have that courage to stand up and say, "No, this is a wider issue about the systems." You know, not throw some individual members of staff to the lions, but to acknowledge that it's a wider systems failure, uh, and that can be very, very difficult. You know, to have that um, courage to stand up but again I think your staff look to you and say well is this somebody who's going to speak up for us is this somebody that's prepared to go into the media or whatever uh, and talk about the truth and confront things Um, and that's really I think where you do get tested where you do get tested in in the heat of the the, you know fire and there in the middle of the ring about whether you're willing to do that And, and I think we're all a combination aren't we of our genes and our environment um, uh, but, but just because we have a certain gene, it doesn't mean that it has to affect us. You know, we can turn them on off. We can control them. Uh, but people find it very easy to, uh, you know, as you just said, to to blame other people for things rather than take that personal responsibility themselves at whatever level. Yeah, and, and, and I think that comes, you know, uh, he used three words um, 
you know, around uh, intelligence and uh, integrity and energy, you know, and I used three other different models, which was really about the fundamentals you need to understand yourself. You under- need to understand your own strengths and weaknesses. Um, and the second one for me is that he, he refers to it as well. You know, you need to understand your business. And part of that is understanding what you know and crucially also what you don't know and yeah. when you need to look for other expertise or advice. And then I think the third thing for me, particularly as you move up the chain, and again, I think in the podcast you talk about, you know, when you move from being the professional to actually being the business person running the organisation, you need to know what's your philosophy of how you get things done in an organisation. Uh, and a lot of it is crucially about, um, as I say, what, what is it you know, what is it you don't know, and how you're going to have people around you that will watch your back as you get into more difficult territory. I'd like to take another clip from Damien Axe before we move on. Um, I love talking about mindset because I think it's so important and that desire to learn from everything and in particular to learn from failure. Uh, and Damien, with his work with uh, sportsmen in particular, is very insightful on mindset. In terms of how important is mindset, again, I'll give you, it's a question that intrigues me and I'll give you an answer from somebody that people listening to this will uh, will we'll know for her achievements. I asked the same question to Dame Kelly Holmes, and I said, when you were in that 800 metres final in Athens in 2004, how important was mindset as opposed to just the physical capacity to run fast? And when she answered it, she said, well, if I tell you that the first four finalists were all capable of running the 800 metres and there was 0.1 of a second that separated us, she said, we can establish that we all had the capacity to run at roughly the same speed. So the question was, who could run at that speed under the pressure of an Olympic final at stake? So she estimated in her answer that it was 80% of um, her success could be attributed to her mindset. 20% of it was down to her physical capacity. I've yet to meet an elite performer that wouldn't give you a ratio of somewhere between 70% of it mindset, 30% of it down to the physical capacity because at a certain level of sport everybody is as fast and as fit and as strong and as obdurate as each other and I'd say it's the same in business most businesses offer a very similar service when you're in an industry at an elite level but then it's down to who you engage with how they listen how they uh, their responsiveness and all the all the characteristics that have made Gunnar Cook so successful over the last decade is what makes it, 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 it is what we can attribute that to. So I'd say mindset is key. In terms of the question around the growth mindset stuff, this originates from the work of Carol Dweck, as you referenced that. So Carol Dweck's a professor of, uh, of psychology, uh, um, predominantly focused on, around children. And her work was pioneered originally at Carnegie in New York, where the famous study she did was where she, she did this with over a thousand children. She divided them up into two groups. So one group was told that they were going to have lessons in further mathematics skills. And the other half of the group were taken away and given lessons in how your brain grows when you challenge it. And the idea that struggle, when you can't quite master something but you persevere and stick at it, makes you smarter. And then the kids were given a series of tests. And what they found is the kids that had been given purely math tests, in other words, they focused on the hard skills, the physical skills of it. They did well when the tests were relatively easy. When they started to get a bit harder, they found the resilience and the perseverance of those kids often fell away quite quickly because they assumed that their math skills didn't stretch that far. Their math skills were almost finite in its capacity and they fell away. The kids that have been taught that your brain gets smarter the more you struggle, the more you work at it, it's like a muscle that needs to be stretched. Those kids were more resilient, they tended to perform better under pressure, and they tended to stick out a task and demonstrate greater perseverance. So who doesn't want to work in a business that does something similar to that? I think by definition, Peter, you must have a growth mindset. You must have that sort of mindset. How would you define mindset? I found this well, this notion really quite complex and difficult in a way um, because sometimes in my experience organisations that have too strong a mindset um, actually are in danger 
um, and, and it's closer to a sort of groupthink and an organisation has a way of doing things and an accepted practice and in a way a very strong mindset but that then that means that they are closed to um to to other risks or to standing back and seeing the wider picture um i i was always nervous about having for instance a senior team that was too cohesive and got on too well i always felt you needed to have a bit of grit in the oyster people that are willing to challenge and question and come in with different views so i think you know there's a downside to having too strong a mindset i think it is about how you have as as, as damon talks about about a challenging culture and in, in innovative culture but there again i think one of the great paradoxes difficulties at the moment certainly in an organization like policing is in some ways you want people to be very innovative forward thinking reflective but at the same time you're working in a world which often has very strict regulation and rules to follow and sometimes for instance in policing almost has, has to act like the army and I know American policing is really debating this at the, at, at the moment so I think in a lot of organizations there is that challenge about you want staff to think for themselves you want them to be challenging um, absolutely you want to learn them from mist- fr- learn from mistakes but on the other hand we all know that there are some areas where you can't afford to make a mistake where because of tighter and tighter regulation. Um, so I think there is that aspect to it. But what, on the other hand, I think if you look at mindset being more about culture uh, and about how, again, you almost you come back to the integrity of the organisation. Just in the last few days, I, I listened to a very interesting discussion. It happened to be about Arsenal Football Club and a reflection why they were doing so badly this year. And it was interesting. All the sports journalists talked about, about they'd lost the success mindset um, they'd got some really good players, but they just could not get them to gel. Uh, and they talked about under, how under Arsene Wenger, um, again, excellence and that growth mindset, that competitive nature went right the way every through every, every aspect of, of the club. And so, you know, for me, that mindset absolutely comes back to integrity, comes back to culture um, and, and come back, as I talked earlier, about that coherence, that what staff experience um, you know, absolutely reflects the cultures and the values of the organisation, that you have that ambition. Um, you, you have an organisation where people absolutely can, can within boundaries, make mistakes and, and learn from it. But, but also, you don't have such a strong mindset that you can't see other risks, other challenges in, in what is now a very complex, fast-changing world. And I guess, actually, what you're describing there as well is is a little bit of a difference between the public and private sector to some extent. We very much encourage people to do things in our organisation. I always say there's no such thing as failure. The only failure is actually not trying. But actually, in your world, there is a thing of failure because you're very much under the public scrutiny and you can't afford to get things wrong. Well, we can, in most cases, can afford to get things wrong and learn from it. Um, I, th- I think that's right, you know, and, and, and the public sector and something like policing is, is really quite brutal at the moment in terms of the way you can be judged on a on an immediate bit of video, um, a social media. Um, somebody like the Home Secretary can tweet a judgment on your operation while the operation is still um, going on. But on the other hand, I think increasingly, you know, if you look at, I don't know, like a supermarket, you know, if you... If you have one bad incident uh, if you sell one dodgy product because you, you've not kept your standards of hygiene then it's quite difficult to have a learning culture in, in that sort of environment so uh, you know I think it all comes back to making sure your staff are are, 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 uh, are expert I get the right sort of training um, and on the other hand have the freedom that when they see something looks like it's going wrong where there does appear to be a fault in a process where there could be some really adverse critical incident that they feel this is an organisation where I can put my hand up and somebody will take me seriously. Yeah, I get that. I get that. Uh, and then actually later in the pod, one of the podcasts, we then went on and we spoke to... Um, Two terrific people. It was a great podcast. Roger Lane Smith, who uh, built DLA into one of the largest law firms in the world, and Sir John Timpson, who is the chairman and owner of, of Timpson's with over 2,000 shops. And their views on, on business and, and evolution were, were fascinating. Let's take a listen. Very much 
businesses change all the time and uh, that's if you're not changing then you're not going to last for a very long time anyway but you need a bit of luck and uh, i've had i've had a lot of luck along the way i mean as far as that major change you talk about going from uh, shoe retailing to shoe shoe repairing and beyond well we shoe retailing was running into, into a very difficult time and uh, we realized we couldn't carry on in that that vein because there were so many competitors uh, we were going to lose money but I had the luck of having a shoe repair business already there so I could sell the shoe retail business and still have something to retain to actually spend my time on and what was was the start a hobby became something uh, has become uh, quite a large business but there again the shoe repair business had, had to change because if you you could not survive as a pure cobbler and that's why shoe that's why cobblers cut keys in the first instance because they couldn't survive just off shoe repairs because the the demand for shoe repairs has been going down every year every year for the last 50 years pretty well so that's why cobblers cut keys so we did into the key cutting and watch repairs and we turn ourselves into a, a, a service business it's just it's just sort of evolution but you've got to have a bit of luck you have got to have the old inspirational moment and when that, when that luck comes along i guess you've just got to have the ability to take advantage of it i recall you once telling me peter when you took over the running of the force that you had to bring a kind of a seismic change in how policing in, in how policing was viewed and how you felt policing should be viewed. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? I took over Greater Manchester Police in 2008 um, and uh, unfortunately there were a number of challenges including the fact that the previous Chief Constable had um, committed suicide um, while under, you know, a number of allegations were made about his private life. And sometimes that gives you an opportunity um, to make some hard decisions. But for me, I suppose it did come back to integrity and coherence um, and the fact that I had to try and get everything to align. I, it was an organisation that had been driven by numerical targets and statistics that of itself had generated a particular management style, which at its worst was, was quite bullying. Um, and I could have just gone for posters on the wall um, and find statements, but I felt, again, that you had to look at every aspect of the organisation. Um, and for me, that meant you had to look at the structures, you had to look at the systems, you had to look at the competencies of the staff, and that if you do that, you then start to change behaviours and attitudes. So, you know, I needed to restructure the force that was much more based around local policing, responsibility to local people and problem solving, um, break down quite a number of the, uh, the, the old squads um, and then make sure that the systems actually supported that and um, that the way we measured things, that what we um, you know, valued and what we saw as important were all directed to that form of, of policing and even the specialist units understood um, that they were, you know, responsible to the public. And, and one of the great pictures I saw was of, of firearms officers um, with all their kit on and some very high-powered weaponry, but actually step, stepping down and, and stooping down and talking to a, a little lad, uh, you know, on the, uh, on the pavement. Um, so, you know, you, you've got to look at the whole thing. And I think sometimes leaders come into a new, a new organisation and think, well, if we do some mission statements and have a bit of a consultation exercise. But for me, it's got to be pretty fundamental fundamental um, to look at the, the whole way that the, the, the force, you know, the organisation operates. Um, uh, and, and as I say, often it is the structures, it is the, it is the power bases, um, it is the relationships, you know, it, it, and, and it is that difference between what somebody at headquarters might say and what is the reality of people's lives. You know, and something like a police force, which operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week across a large number of geographical sites in a place like Greater Manchester, that was even more important in terms of the fact that the whole thing flowed. And as I say, that there was that coherence and that integrity and that alignment in everything that was going on. And I asked, um, it's interesting, it leads on very well. I also asked uh, Roger and John um, about the leadership approach. Uh, and they had some really interesting views because I think John in particular has developed this theory of upside down management. Let's just listen to uh, a couple of minutes of that. 
the people think they're doing that when they consult. I mean, so they go to the, go to the people in the front line and say, "What would you like to do?" And then they tell them what they've got to do once they've got the consensus. That's not what we're talking about. I mean, the problem with most businesses is that the, the middle management won't let go of the ability to tell people what to do, and they won't understand that what they should be doing is make is clearing the obstacles out of the way of the people in the front line, and they spend their lives putting obstacles in the way. The obstacles being the way they, the, the, uh, uh, the standing orders they've got to follow. Not helped, I might say, knowing I'm talking to quite a lot of lawyers, by uh, all, all the governance that goes on and all the things we try to do to make sure that we, we, we stick to the regulations that have been brought in over the last few years. But you're, not, you're not saying either that there doesn't have to be process. Process is, surely uh, is, good, is good for business, isn't it? No, no. Process, uh, policy and process are the things that screw up businesses. Okay. You, that's... If you don't have all this policy and process, you can clear out a lot of uh, quite highly highly paid people in the middle who are actually putting the, the, bar- the barriers in the way that, that make life difficult on the front line. Strategy, what, what you, your central people should be doing is creating the strategy and communicating it and letting the people out there get on and do it and providing all the support they need to do it. Does that not put a lot of pressure as well on recruitment? Because you've got yes, to get the right absolutely. people into the business to do Spot that. On. Your first thing you'll discover is it only works if you've got the right people. Mm-hmm. And so you, you pick people according to their personality. Not, and and uh, I mean, recruitment's getting worse because it's pretty well been done online and they don't actually even meet the people they're recruiting sometimes these days. But recruit... You, you don't recruit for skills, recruit for personalities. You can, you can, you can train people up. But you, they need to have, obviously, certain jobs, they need to have some, some, some ability in that direction. But it's not, it's not actually the recruitment. You've got to add to recruitment. The other, the other thing which is vital is you've got to make sure you've got a whole organisation full of people who rate 9 or 10 out of 10. And you can't get there unless you're willing to say goodbye to the people who aren't good enough. And I don't mean by lots of warning letters and performance management pro- programs and following all, all that the employment lawyers say. The way to do that is actually to talk to people and you'll discover that most of your poor performers who are frankly irritating and getting in the way of the people who are good actually don't enjoy their job. And you've got to help them to find their happiness elsewhere, working for someone else. Gosh, I think he really took me to task there, didn't he? And, 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 but I do understand what he's saying. And, he, and, and I think it will be a surprise, though, to a lot of business leaders in particular, where John is saying, I think his words were, that policy and process destroy business. He, you know, he thinks that bureaucracy actually destroys businesses and you've got to work, get away from it. And, and the way he gets away from it, as he says, is making sure you've got the right people in the business, the right people surrounding you, the right personalities with you, and then you can get rid of the, the, the processes if you've got that. Gosh, there's so much in that section. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I think Timson will must have policies and processes. You can't go in and ask for work to be done and not pay for it, for instance. Um, but I know what he's saying. And certainly there came a point in Greater Manchester Police where we faced uh, big financial cuts and it actually enabled me to take a lot of people out of headquarters um, who were involved in policy and process. And I'd been saying very much that the job of headquarters is not to run the world. You know, your job is to try and make it easier for the police officers on the front line trying to protect the public. Um, so in, in one way, I know what he's saying there. Um, and I think for a lot of charities, you know, they start off, um, they've got a particular passion, a particular focus. And as they grow bigger, they start building in processes and obviously have to comply with JDPR or, or whatever it might be. Um, and that starts getting in the way of absolutely what was their original mission. And I think through the pandemic, you've seen that 
um, you know, often very small charities, locally based charities have been able to react very nimbly and quickly because they've not burdened down by lots of process and, and procedure. So I think, again, it's it's a paradox out there. You do absolutely need very good people. Um, you do absolutely need to make sure you've got policies and processes in the high risk areas. But I think that it's then still possible within your organisation to create as much room as possible for innovation um, and ownership. So for me, again, it was about creating local neighbourhood teams led by an inspector where I could say, you do what's best for your local people and I will hold you account by what local councillors and local people say about the service that you're providing and whether you're responding to the issues which are really, really important to them. Um, you know, so I think you can do that. But even then, absolutely, you need to recruit really good people. Um, but you need as well, you know, as part of integrity and honesty, at the same time to describe here are the boundaries that you need to work in, if nothing else, to protect their backs in a highly accountable world. Yeah, I, I think I, um, I, I, I um, remember once listening to, I think it was Alan Layton when he was at the post office, who talked about at a very senior level, they'd have a vision and, and, and they wanted to achieve certain things, but they'd find it would often get stuck within what he described as the treacle, you know, in the mm. level below that mm. bu- level of bureaucracy that just held things up. And what they'd have to do was go into that, uh, that treacle, pull it out and start the process again quite often. Because the reality is people at that middle level will want to prove themselves. They will think their job is to design a new process, to come up with a new initiative. Um, and the more people you have in your organisation like that, they all have to be involved, they all have to be consulted and they get in the world. You know, in, in Greater Manchester Police, and sadly it's not changed in policing, there were nine levels between me and the guy or, or, or the woman on the ground that was providing the service. And that is a huge burden to actually carry. And we know that the most successful businesses have absolutely shortened those lines flatten their organisation, um, crucially because they want to give as much room as possible to people on the, on the front line, but they absolutely realise the difficulty of chains of communication. And as I say, it's just in human nature that if you have people in the middle, they themselves will want to draw up their own initiatives and have their own impact, but that then just adds confusion often to those on the front line. Yeah, yeah. And I did like John's approach as well to uh, recruiting the right people, making sure people with the, the mindset that we talked about earlier, they've definitely got that, that right mindset for you people. But also when you let people go, the very human way of letting people go. I often think that, that lawyers, to some extent, have created these processes of how you have to let people go because they're frightened of the consequences. Um, but actually what John was saying, look, you, you just need to sit down and work with people and help them, show them in the wrong place and they might be happier somewhere else. And that very human process of... Uh, uh, of developing your workforce well, it comes back to really the coaching conversation as well doesn't it you know it, it is absolutely about having leaders and managers who have that sort of coaching relationship and i always used to say to my sergeants and in, inspectors you know alex ferguson arson wenger you know um th- 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 they don't write books about it as such you know they're on the they're on the touchline all the time shouting at people encouraging them you know and, and for me you know for instance the good sergeants were somebody who, who just grabbed hold of somebody and said look let me you know and dealt with an issue at the time and didn't let it fester and had that self-confidence and courage to be able to do that, but in a, do it in a way which didn't destroy the confidence of that of that constable. So I think it's absolutely about that constant conversation that people know how they're doing, that they've been encouraged. But we know that one of the biggest things that destroys the morale of a team, if they think there is an underperformer in this team and our leader is not tackling that underperformer um, and, and I absolutely agree that again HR departments can get absolutely stymied by processes and I actually said to my HR department at one point you know that you're just no good at managing people because you see them all as figures and processes and and you know I, I you know I always try and make a point if an officer got injured to, to write to them or go and see them uh, and take an interest in them and, and see them as human beings um, and, and that can get lost when you're just obsessed with processes and your organisation gets too big. And then there was Hassan, Hassan Damluji, the Deputy Director of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I, I, I really enjoyed this discussion. I think it's very close to my heart. Um, And I think good leaders are really special and sometimes unusual people. But they have, if you get good leaders, they've got this great influence. And the world is changing very rapidly. Um, 
So these good leaders are needed even more. Generation Z millennials now accounting for 75% of the population mm. in the world. So in my view, much more is expected of leaders. The stakeholders in a business goes way beyond shareholders today, I think, in a business. Um, so it was really interesting to hear uh, Hassan's views on some of this. Let's just play a little clip. Because I think the days when... Uh, people wanted a job just for a job, uh, contributes to social equality. I mean, the danger is, look at a country like the UK, where so much of business, especially the wealth of business, is in London, is if we leave these social problems to be sorted out by the square mile around the business, you're just going to have more funds going into London than you are into Sunderland. Uh, and so that's not not okay. But But nevertheless, Businesses, whether they're global, national or local to a town, um, can do so much. And I think what's hard for businesses, yes, you pointed out quite rightly that they don't have bureaucracy necessarily and that they have freedom of movement. But what constrains them is the need to make profit. What constrains them is the idea that this is a distraction and that idea that this is a distraction, uh, that, that somehow doing good. Uh, what, what could that be? Um, so helping to support a local school. Um, you know, London schools um, have improved really, really rapidly from being terrible um, 20, 25 years ago. And part of that is because there was increasing businesses in London, backed schools, uh, academies that happened elsewhere, but probably less for reasons that I already described um, outside London. So you know, we, we need to change that. It needs to be in every city. You, know, you can support a local school, you can uh, offer apprenticeships, not just to the kids of your employees or your friends, but actually to the people who really need them and don't have educational opportunities in that mile you described around the bit, and so on and so forth. So, so I think the risk is that feels like a distraction to the business leader or to their board, their investors. And I think for me, one of the most powerful reasons that is really bottom line associated is that if you want the best talent, you need to tell a story to your employees of how they are helping with social issues. Because I think the days when uh, people wanted a job just for a job uh, have passed. And, you know, there are many people who are in the uh, position where any job will be better than, than not having a job. But if you really want the best talent, these are people with options. And it, increasingly, they want to choose something where they can tell a story to their friends, to their family, to themselves about how they are contributing. And if you can find a way for your business to be contributing, that is how to hold on to um, the best talent. Uh, and um, even for that reason alone, it's worth making sure that you're contributing to that to that mile surrounding your business as you imply. I think that's a that's a great point, and I, and I I do I mean I think you know over the years we've had uh, CSR kind of corporate social responsibility that's come into businesses, but it's largely become um, something that is a, a box that has to be ticked. Window and dressing hasn't really yes hasn't and and I and it, and it's it's largely failed. I think you know going out you know digging the same gardens, painting the same walls isn't really meaningful or or, or in the way that it was meant to be. And you know I think is and 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 it's not helping the business either. So I think there needs to be a shift where leaders of businesses need to recognize, uh, as you know, as you just said, actually they can play. I think Michael Porter at Harvard talks about there is no reason why it can't be good for your business. It should be good for your business. And then it's sustainable. Um, if it's not good for your business, it won't be sustainable. You won't continue to do it. But I think it would be um, a real step forward for leaders and chief executives to start to understand just what's around their businesses, what's within the square mile. Because every issue, you know, it's like a microcosm of all the issues that we face in society. And as you say, if they get involved in the local schools, if they get involved in the lo loneliness issues or the mental health issues, then they can have a real difference. And if you replicate that right across the country, it's going to make a massive difference. Um, but it's getting, it's moving away from CSR and getting them to really understand that they can play a part and they can make a difference. I totally agree. And to me, as I uh, talk to businesses about their, you know, more sort of philanthropic type of activities, 
when we talk about CSR and I'm directed to the communications department, I know that it's not going to be a very fruitful conversation. So, you know, <laughs> I would say, is it the majority? I certainly don't have the data, but probably most um, big businesses put uh, CSR within communications. And you've, you've kind of killed the uh, um, opportunity for real impact by the incentive structure where really the goal is communication. I mean, if you want to stick it within an existing department, I would rather put it within HR in terms of what I was just talking about. about this is about how do we really develop and excite our talent. I think this is something, Peter, that a lot of business leaders are now struggling with. I think mm-hmm. what a business leader is trying to do, they're trying to increase the revenues of the business. They're trying to increase the profits. That that's, that's, is their ultimate aim. And one of the best ways of doing that and, and, and survey after survey show is creating that really strong culture around a business so that people are coming into work because they want to be there. They want to be part of that business. So, you know, you're creating a real buzz around a business. And unfortunately, I think a lot of these the um, awards that are given out are kind of best companies to work for, et cetera, et cetera, driven by a perk culture. You know, and perks, mm-hmm. perks don't... Perks drive entitlement. They don't always drive culture and how you treat each other, how you uh, respect each other. And I, but I think actually what Hassan's talking about, if, if you get your employees engaged beyond the business, then they feel a real pride in that business. They they want to be part of to it. They, they're proud of it. They want to be part of it. They improve themselves. They, imp- they, they make a, a they, they play a role in society and at the same time they improve the business it goes back again to mindset you get the right people in and they want to do more they want to do so much more so they're not just concerned about the revenues of the business they are concerned about what else they can do and interestingly that definitely leads to a better business with better revenues yeah, I mean, I think my difficulty with this, I felt Hassan talked about it being about trying to attract the most talented people. And I felt it was crucial for all my staff. And I felt my job as a leader was try to make sure that what we were asking them to do was as closely aligned as possible to their sense of vocation. Uh, and I was particularly struck by this going to visit uh, Cheadle Hume Police Station and met an officer who was looking very anguished. And when I spoke to him what it was about, he said because he was dealing with a young lad and our target culture meant that he was supposed to issue a caution to this lad, which would have gone on his record. And he felt this, this would not have been good for the lad long term. And for me, it was an example that we put in a process which absolutely conflicted with that officer's sense of vacation. So, so for me, it applies to all staff. Um, and, and again, it's about how your organisation operates. Um, you know that I got involved um, with a charity where we ended up taking groups of police officers in their own time to Africa. Um, and that was great fun in terms of the fundraising, but it then also had an, an crucial, you know, incredible impact on those officers who understood where the roots of modern slavery and tra- human trafficking came from in Africa. And, and it was, um, and, but it was also about the, the organisation looking outwards and seeing the wider world. Uh, and I do think this has developed further. As you say, it's much more than just corporate social responsibility. Um, it's about recognising if you want your business on the whole to be successful, wider issues in society like the skills of young people have to be fundamentally improved. You know, it's no good complaining about your organisation has been damaged by fraud um, or burglaries or whatever if you're not playing possibly in a part in your local community to try and support local sports clubs or youth organisations or whatever. Uh, and I think even people like Pope Francis have now talked about how the whole world is interconnected, you know, that we, 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 we're not just one island. You know, things like the, all the issues about information technology, all the issues about climate change, mass migration – you know, we're in an interconnected world. So if you want your organisation to be successful, um, again, it's about how generating, you know, that local community effort. Um, uh, and you and I have been involved with, you know, the Inspire initiative trying to support some very local charities. And some of those absolutely need people to be trustees. They need access to HR advice and legal advice. But a lot of them also got this idea about how you build that local sense of community, how you recognise that in most areas there are people with enormous life experience, enormous talents, uh, which often get ignored. And, and we've sort of professionalised and privatised a lot of issues around charity. And again, the pandemic experience has shown that things like the vaccination programme have been incredibly successful because they've mobilised a huge army of volunteers. 
So I think all this is connected. It's how your own staff have got that vocation and that wish to, to do good. And even whatever they're doing, understand how it helps the public and, 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 and benefits ordinary people's lives. But it's also about how the operation of your organisation is playing its part in that local community and, and how that absolutely will affect your bottom line and, and affect the whole environment in which your organisation is operating. And I think as well that the uh, the corporate and business world is still catching up with some of this because there are some terrific business leaders out there. But there's still this kind of view developed by Milton Freeman years ago that the whole idea was that business was about making profit. You made the profit, you give it to your shareholders, and they used to spend it however they want to do. Whereas I think now there is a, there's a very, very strong view that's, that's, that's developed about the purpose of business is far beyond profit. You know, that is, you know, there's lots of different stakeholders. and They're just financial stakeholders. Mm -hmm. There's lots of different stakeholders in the business. And it is customers, it is employees, but also it is communities. And, mm -hmm. and your employees want you to engage with those communities and uh, and help and assist those those communities. Mm -hmm. You know, in fields like modern slavery, you know, more and more businesses are recognising that if you don't understand your whole supply chain um, and that, you know, you may be sourcing some of your clothing from sweatshops in Asia or some of the fine building materials from bonded labour in places like India, that is, you know, number one, fundamentally going to damage your, the image of your organisation as well as possibly making you legally liable. Um, uh, but, 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 but also just, you know, creates the conditions where people are exploited and you have a very unhealthy um, you know, business culture, which is more and more of a race to the, to the bottom. So I think absolutely more and more organisations have realised that, you know, more and more organisations are realising the part they play in the green agenda. Um, you know, and again, that's not just something for a bunch of campaigners or, or, or activists. And they're recognising that this is absolutely crucial um, to the way their customers are going to regard them, but crucially as well that the way that their own staff are going to regard them. Um, and they'll want to see that and they'll want to take pride in that and feel more motivated if they see the organisation is playing its part. And, and actually as well, what I feel really strongly about it, we, you know, I'm absolutely certain it's good for a business. It's got to be good for a business. So every CEO should really sit down and work out how they end engage with it but also I think what is such a good opportunity is those CEOs in a really good position because they're very very influential people they can make things happen without some of the restrictions that you get in politics that you get in government that you get elsewhere they've got stakeholders I completely get that and their job as leaders is to bring everybody with them but they do have that influence to make things happen and they just encourage them to exercise that influence so that you're right they leave a legacy their family are mm -hmm. proud of them their business mm -hmm. is proud of them they'll feel much better for it and actually they will make a real difference. And what we've also seen, Daryl, I, I think increasingly is, is whether we like it or not, that governments can't solve a lot of these problems. You know, the UK government cannot solve the, the issue of multinational businesses, um, you know, the regulation of the internet, climate change, all these issues. You know, power lies in a different place now. Um, and often, exactly as you say, business and the market um, have enormous power and influence now probably, you know, a greater ability to change things than governments through law and, and regulation. Um, and again, it's about how they work together and, and harness that and at times need to be competitive, but other, other times need to be collaborative. Good. Well, let's hope we've uh, helped one or two people and perhaps hopefully perhaps change the people. I've got people thinking anyway, that would be, uh, that'd be a very valuable thing to do. Never thought I'd see such opportunity extraordinarily wonderful Finally, we had a very interesting chat with uh, Alison Grade. Alison was the author of the Freelance Bible about, and it's about this growing trend that is happening of, of being self-employed and growing a business starting with yourself. And what was really fascinating about it was I thought it came back to that looking at the personal characteristics that you need in order to develop, which are very relevant whether you're developing your own business or whether you're in a larger business. Let's listen to one or two things that uh, Alison said. You know, that that comes before everything, because if you're not in good shape as a freelancer, you can't do the work properly. Um, and then from there, those skills of resilience and really that security, being secure in the insecurity of the income and just knowing that and trusting that you're doing the work and it will come in. And, and as you say, doing that regular biz dev so that you are absolutely making sure that your sales pipeline's filled. But it's also about that professionalism. And 
I think you've got to have some kind of initiative and get up and go and actually be somebody who is a self-starter or can get yourself into that space where you keep that momentum and you build it. She taught us a lot there, really, about personal discipline, mm-hmm. Peter, about resilience, those sort of characteristics uh, which are relevant to all of us. Uh, that you must have had to uh, um, <laughs> grapple with, with self-discipline and resilience at various times in, in your career. Absolutely. Um, you know, I was under criminal investigation for eight months um, while still being chief constable. I obviously had two police officers sadly um, shot dead on duty and at various times came under huge political pressure to make decisions in particular ways that suited those politicians. Um, and, you know, my reflection afterwards really um, came comes back to what I talked about at the beginning. It, it is about, you know, your own integrity. It is about how firm is your personal foundation. Um, And for me, it was about saying to upcoming leaders, you've got to be really sure about where is your line on this in the sand. You know, and the point to make that decision is not when you're in the middle of the crisis, but actually you've thought that through beforehand. Um, So for me, it is about the strength of your own value system, understanding your own personality. um, Absolutely being willing to have, you know, networks and people that will support you um, and to be honest enough as to, as to when you need need help. But, you know, it, it comes back to that that foundation of your own values. Um, and I think, again, you, t- you talked about it, that self-discipline and, and that expertise that, you know, when you're going through an issue, you have researched it properly. You know, you have, as, as, as Damien talked about, done things like pre-mortems where you've anticipated what things could go wrong. And have a plan, you know, around that. So, you know, you have to build that that complexity. But ultimately, as I say, you, you need to have your own values and to know that when you come under pressure, this is my line in the sand, and I'm not going to shift from that. Um, and, and it's still going to be be difficult. Um, but you know, you've got that inner strength. That is also going to mean, ho- hopefully, that you stand firm, um, and you're not going to be buffeted by different winds and different initiatives and different personalities. But obviously, in an increasingly media-focused world, short-term world, in the public service, politically controlled world, that is going to get more and more difficult. Uh, and to some extent, if that trend continues, we're, get, we're just going to get the leaders we deserve. Is that just something that just comes with experience, though? That um that personal discipline, that resilience, developing those things, is it some, or is it something you can sit down and actually learn and teach yourself? No, I think you're right. I think it does come from experience. But on the other hand, I think you make your own experience. You know, I know you put a lot of store by reading books. I'd have to be honest, I've not been a great one for reading books. I always felt I had to go out and look at things and have different things in my life. I gained a huge amount from being a police leader, actually being a chair of governors of a school that was going through special measures. I learned so much from that experience. But I also found that whenever I went out on the front line, when I spent time with police officers, um, other members of staff, they had the answers. I think it's, I can't remember, it's Nissan or Toyota, you know, say the best ideas come from those actually doing the job. And I always found that. I very rarely had a good idea myself. It's that ability that you go around and you do things and you make connections and you see that difference between the reality you thought was happening and what's happening. And it's incredibly, you know, when you go and see the Home Secretary in the Home Office and you say, yesterday I was on patrol in Bolton and I saw this, that's actually pretty strong and powerful for somebody who could possibly be sitting in an ivory tower. So I think you make your own experience and your own judgment by constantly looking out and doing other things. And a lot of that is absolutely, for me, always was what I was doing in you know, my personal life as well. And even now, I'm you know, enormously lucky that I'm involved in lots of different charities and different things. And a lot of it is just making those connections and saying, well, that's interesting what's going over here, over here. That connects to something over there. And I think all that helps to build your resilience and your ability to see the world, you know, in, in a broad way. And again, you know, for me, what always made the difference between really good leaders is they saw the world as a big, wide open, complex place. And the ones that always worried me were the ones that saw it operating within tram lines and, 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 and tunnel vision. Um, but that comes from you being curious yourself, being curious, going out, 
I've never been a great one for work-life balance, I'll be honest. You know, for me, you have an opportunity in life and I had a certain period being a chief constable and I tried to take every bit of opportunity. And yes, sometimes you think, why am I going to this thing tonight? Why is that in the diary? And you get there and you meet some amazing people and you come away humbled and think, gosh, I'm really pleased. I went and talked to those people. That's given me another insight. Added a little bit more to, to, to my background. And that all helps to build that strength and that resilience and that firm foundation. I can't imagine a more perfect message to uh, to finish on. So thank you for that, Peter. I've really enjoyed that, Peter. I hope you have. Leadership to me is really important, but it can mean, you know, running the Village Hall Committee as much as running Amazon. It can re- mean running a small group or a larger business or a, in a larger business or a football team, or it can mean leading yourself. And the things we've discussed are just as important in all those scenarios. I hope that you've enjoyed today's podcast. Please let us know if you have. And let us know of anyone that you think we should invite on the show to share their recipes with us. The next series will be coming up shortly. I'm already looking forward to it. As will our book on inspiring leadership due out shortly. Let us know if you'd like a copy. Go forth and be a great and inspiring leader. God bless and thank you. All the world is feeling fine I can jump for joy Feel ecstatic Sun comes around Now the Atlantic Morning Good morning Good morning